what they're, they're, they're for, you know, kind of paving the road <laughs> for my talk. So I mean, before I before I start my talk, I would like to have a very quick question. So how many of you have had experience dealing with a two-year-old? Okay. So how many of you were once two-year-old? That's great. You know, so basically, if you imagine you bring a two-year-old the first time into a candy store, and you give him one candy, and after he finishes that first candy, what do you think he's going to do? Pardon me? He's going to ask for another one. And after the second one, what is he going to do? Ask another one. So that's a human nature. Uh, I don't know if it's a, is that working? Fine. I think it's probably on. Um, or can you hear me? Uh, it's not on. So I'll just keep using them. So basically, I'm trying to say that is actually a very common human nature. And, uh, and now, if you look at something else, the whole human being has been doing, and actually we even adults, we are acting, are acting just like that two-year-old. So I'd like to start from 800 years ago. At that time, actually, we human being, we discovered coal. It's like we discovered candy. And uh, we see coal, and you figure out, oh, actually we can use coal to heat and to cook. What do you do? You use it a lot. And this actually led to the first anti-air pollution law because of, you know, kind of tremendous use of coal. And actually, if I can read it out uh, loudly, it's the first anti-air pollution law, be it known to all within the sound of my voice, whosoever shall be found guilty of burning coal shall suffer the loss of his head. So this was actually by King Edward I about 800 years ago. One eight hundred years ago, right? So now, eight hundred years later, we are asking ourselves, human beings, a similar question: Can we travel or get somewhere with clean air? Before we were asking about human you know, cooking with clean air, now we're talking about travel with clean air. So I'm going to talk about transportation environment and energy systems, especially from transportation to public health. And uh, I would like to, that through the talk, you will realize how important system thinking is. Right? So, first of all, how do you get to campus today? So, I know, like, you know, even though we are a very big, here in Italy, is a very small town, but we are fortunate to have the TCAT system. And actually, as a faculty, every night I try to check the TCAT bus. And when I was taking, you know, on the bus, how many of you have saw kind of this kind of picture on the back of the driver's seat? For safety, do not cross the bus in front of the bus. But have you ever seen this? <laughs> Standing behind this bus could be even more dangerous. And I don't know if you can read this here. These are few can kill. So actually, based on a uh, you know, study back in 2000, published in Lancet, more people are killed by vehicle emissions than by traffic accidents. So here is just some new community truths about transponder emissions. So after a study done by NYU found out that in New York City, air pollution can even reach babies in the womb when they're still in development. And then, of course, everybody knows that Los Angeles has been notorious for its air pollution. And if someone is born there, grew up there, worked there, and she will have a double chance of developing cancer later in her life than the natural diet. And then, how are all these things related to transportation? So in the US, transportation accounts for about 30% of overall greenhouse gas emissions, and then about 50% of ozone precursor emissions. I'll talk about ozone shortly. And then also about 10 to 65% of the particulate matter pollution. These are all related to transportation. Diesel. 
that we have done a lot of work ever since the 1970s with the Clean Air Act. We have done an excellent job cleaning up our cars. A car we're driving today is about 99% cleaner than the car people, people go back in the 1970s. However, diesel, diesel particles show about 21,000 lives here in the US every year. And the reason why now diesel is a big headache is because actually, if you look at the diesel particles, diesel particle has a consistent effect, which is about 7.5 times larger than all the other air pollutants combined together. And actually, there was a very interesting study, also done by NYU, figured out actually in South Bronx area. There are, in the, the asthma rate among the school and children is about 21 to 23 percent, which is about three times larger than the national average. Do you know why? And if you, if you see this thing here, in that small area, the hot spot area, we have the fish market, meat market, flower market, which is the world's largest food distribution center. And every morning before 7 a.m., there are more than 13,000 diesel trucks. Means that small area. Do you know what they're doing there? They're idling. They're idling and they're refrigerating, waiting to be loaded or unloaded. And the diesel particles. Right? So, so now, now, for EPA or for actually a lot of countries across the world, the major thing how are we going to be able to clean up this diesel fleet? Right? So, it actually means a lot of investment. Actually, if we want for this country, if we want to clean up the more than one, you know, 11 million, 11 million en diesel engines, we need to have about $55 billion investment. Who is going to pay for that? And also, as human beings, we want to do something, we think that we are smart, and we want to do things in a smart way. Or in another word, we want to do things in a cost effective way. Right? Okay, different diesel engines. And uh, what kind of technologies are available and how can we match different technologies with different di diesel engines to reduce emissions? So that's you know, some of the work we did. Okay, we want to help the society to do things. It's very diesel clean up in a smart way, so we did this. Don't worry about this thing. Overall purpose is basically, okay, we want to clean up a diesel fleet with a minimum cost, but making certain emission reduction requirement. So, so far you can see that we want to clean up this diesel fleet in the most cost-effective way. But the thing is, are we doing the right thing? So far you say that, you know, because, okay, diesel engines are dirty, it's unhealthy, so we want to clean up the diesel fleet. And also now we want to clean up the diesel fleet in the most cost-effective way. Yes, the model I developed can help managers to reduce diesel emissions in the most cost-effective way, but there is a problem. It is cost-effective, but it is unfair. And this is a very busy slide. So we actually checked into the New York State had a program uh, back in 2003. New York State has about they have five million dollars. They want to invest in clean up the diesel. Okay, this is a limited funding, and then we want to use the money in the most effective way. So actually, we target, we're targeting the school buses. Uh, the school buses. So how it works is that okay, they send out the request for proposal to all the school districts, and then the school district will respond with the proposal. And then after the manager receives all the proposals, and he's going to do analysis thinking how he can add, you know, how he can allocate his money in the most cost-effective way, which means that he's trying to see how he can maximize the emission reduction per buck of investment. However, it's this process that actually represents a very unfair process. Let's look at this. In that practice, in the first thing I will point out, we compare the school district who sent in the proposal versus some school district, they didn't even send in the proposal. The reason why? And because it's a statistic model, we found out that for the school district, every 1,000 increase in the median, in the median household income of the school district, there is a significant increase of the odds for that school district to send in 
their application. And we were very curious and we were like, why this happened? It turns out, as Derek said, there was a very simple answer to that. You know, as a faculty member here, you know, we, we write proposals. We understand how hard it is to write a proposal. And the proposal writer needs to be trained. However, the research school district, they are able to hire staff to work on the proposal. While poor school districts, they don't have resources. So as a result, Richard School District sending the application. The first stage, this application stage, there is unfairness, there is kind of an equity issue. The second stage, me as a manager, when I receive all these uh, applicants, now we compare those who receive the funding versus those who didn't receive funding, but among all those who sent in the application. It turns out, again, the Richard School District received more funding have a better chance to receive funding than those for us for this field. You know why? Again, it turns out to be very simple. We are talking about the retrofitting the school buses. If a school bus is very, very new, very young, do you think you, it's worth retrofitting? Yes or no? Actually, no, because the newer buses, they are already using the new technologies. The newer buses already have very low emissions. So from a cost-effective point of view, if you add some retrofit technologies, it, you know, the marginal reduction is very low. And if it's a very old bus, are you going to retrofit that very old bus? From a cost-effective point of view, not again, because the remaining life is going to be very short. So in the end, from a cost-effective point of view, you are going to invest your money on the medium-aged buses. On the other hand, the regional school district you know, they, are, they have staff kind of to manage, to optimize the management of their school bus fleet such that they can update their school fleet in a very good way because if before a school bus becomes too old, they sell it to a poorer school district. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you can see their fleet lies right at the sweet spot of this most cost effective image reduction. So, what I'm trying to say is that if you only pursue cost effectiveness. And a lot of times in environmental abatement, you ignore equity issues. So now, assuming we know this, I design a program trying to reduce, co reduce emissions most cost effectively and also in an equitable way. What else? Are we doing the right thing or not? So now I would like to touch upon this ozone closure. Ozone in the higher atmosphere, it's actually good for us because it reduces the UV uh, kind of you know, uh, penetration. However, the ground level ozone is very bad for human health, it's very for kids' lung development, and also ground level ozone is very bad for crop production. It affects the crop yield. And also, ozone is not directly emitted from a source. It's actually formed in the atmosphere through solar radiation, you know, this is what we call photo. Uh, for chemical reactions. So don't worry about this part, this is from chemistry, but look at oh I don't know why it's not showing up here correctly. But anyway, ozone is formed in the atmosphere by two precursor gases. One is what we call oh, this uh, volatile organic compounds and another one, another one is nitrogen oxides. So these are all kind of emitted from the original source, especially in urban areas Transportation is the single major source for VOC and NOx. So now, from airport control point of view, if you know that transportation is a major source for the precursor of VOC and NOx, and NOx what would you do to control ozone pollution? And a very reasonable strategy will be we reduce transportation emission. Right? I think that kind of makes perfect sense to everyone from here. Right. However, now I'd like to show you this graph. On the left is actually the measurement of ozone pollution, and each curve here represents a different day of the week. So this is y axis is ozone concentration. I don't know if you know you can see that. Can you, can anyone tell me what which one which day is this curve corresponding to? Sunday. Which one is the second curve corresponding to? Saturday, which is ozone pollution. 
Now, on the right, I have to show the NUX. Remember, the NUX is a precursor to form ozone. If you look at NUX, can you tell me which, which day is this curve correspond to? Sunday. And uh, this curve corresponds to Saturday. So if you look at these two graphs and think about the previous slide, our strategy to reduce ozone pollution is to reduce transport emission. Now you look at this slide. Did you find something weird or counterintuitive? Hmm. Right? It's like you, you, on Sunday, NUX goes down, we reduce it. However, ozone goes up. Which means that our initial strategy is not working. So this effect is known as ozone weekend effect. Ozone weekend effect. You can see that. So if you know, the blue one shows the traffic from weekdays to weekend, traffic goes down and emissions go down, and actually ozone pollution goes up. So using this example, and uh, I think I want to kind of echo what you know Gerald and also Derek talked earlier. This complexity of systems. The major reason is because the ozone system is a non-linear system. It's not that you reduce the cursor, you reduce the outcome. So, but now the question, oh, seem like, okay, ozone pollution seems like very complicated. Now, how are you going to come up with transport policy to improve air quality? And uh, one thing is that, okay, after we have atmospheric scientists, air quality models, who have been very clear understanding of this nonlinearity of the ozone system. So the answer is that we can combine air quality models and the transporter models together. That way, we have any transport policy, we know what is going to come out on the air pollution side. So this is actually what we did. So this is suppose, is this a PDF? This is what I have the dynamics uh, here, but it's basically every hour, and every place actually will show that, you know, this auto constraint is changing, right? Uh, but so far, okay, well, we have thought about cost-effective reduction, we talked about AQP, now we do understand nonlinearity, and we have a way to deal with nonlinearity. What's next? There's this more complicated particle matter proof. Particles. Particles are different from ozone. Ozone is just O3. Particles, if you think about this particle in this room, if you collect all these particles, these particles, they are a mix of different things and they have different sizes. And also, it's interesting, if a particle, now if I say, if you have a basketball here, you have a basketball of size 10 and you have a basketball of size 1. The difference between the size of these two balls is just a 10. Right? What is going to be the difference, assuming the same density, what is going to be the difference between the max of these two basketballs? One size one, one size ten. What's the difference between the mass of these two basketballs? Is that still ten times? It's actually one thousand times the max. Because volume is the sum, right? So in that case, if you think about, you collect all the particles in this, you know, in a cubic meter of air, and you weigh the particles. Do you think the mass of the particles is going to be dominated by larger particles or smaller particles? Actually, larger particles, the mass, particle mass. So this is actually what this graph on the, on the bottom shows. <laughs> it shows that, you know, the particle size of the this is the mass concentration, because it's the larger particles, like PM, PM10 means particles smaller than 10 microns, and also PM200 means smaller than 2.5 microns. However, imagine if you collect all the particles, you count it, you count all the particles. The number of particles, one size 10 particle could, equivalent to, it could, could be equivalent to 1,000 size 1 particle. Actually, if you count the particles, the particle numbers is going to be dominated by the smaller particles. So we, we, we think of the numbers, actually the out of one smaller particle will dominate. Now, if you can look on the right hand side, what the impact, the impact of particles on our human health? The larger particles, we have the nose system, the upper breathing uh, system that will screen out the larger particles. It's going to be those smaller particles that will be able to reach deeper in our lung. And it's going to be those ultra fine particles that can get into our blood. 
Well, this atom part gets into the blood, where do they go? They can go anywhere, right? They can go to a brain, they can go to a heart, right? Now, let's look at this. We said that the transporter has a very important impact on particles. So, researchers have shown, so here at zero, we have a road, we have a road, and we have traffic. This is the upper wind, right? I mean, imagine like you know, the road is going that there was a perpendicular root wind coming by. And then, so this is a downwind. So basically, if you compare the difference between upwind and downwind, you'll be able to understand the impact of transportation on particle emissions, uh, on particle uh, pollution. So this is actually we use a particle, we measure the particle mass, the relative particle mass in the upper wind, which is the background to the fish, which is about this level. And due to transportation, it reaches here, it's and then it degrades here. However, if you look at the particle numbers, if you write the particle number, remember the particle numbers are dominated by smaller ones, which are more dangerous. The particle numbers, the background is about this way. Due to transport, it shoots up here, and then it's done. So if you want to examine the, the impact of transportation on particular emission, on particular pollution, what kind of metrics would you like to use? Particle mass or particle number? Particle number, because that represents impact. Let me show you one study we did back in the New York City. So we kind of, we brought our equipment. We were like commuters in New York City, right? We take the subway train and we went to the park and we drove also on the street. And we measure, first we measure here the particle mass concentration across different facility types, different locations. Here, like we were driving on the road and we were on the ground station, a transfer station. We were, in the, we were in the park, we were on the subway train, we take the subway train, and then we were you at an underground subway station. And then this is at, on the urban street side. So these are the measurements of PM2.5 mass concentration. Now assuming that if you were the mayor of New York City and you want to do something true in the public that you care about them, you say, I, you have some, I, I have like $1 billion, I would like to clean up the transponder system in New York City. Where do you think you should spend that money if you look at this graph? Pardon me? The underground station, that makes perfect sense because the subway station, the subway system in New York, more than 100 years old, with all those tasks, and when the train passed by, it all would come up, right? It's very high. However, if I show you another graph, which is measured simultaneously with more measuring the particle mass, here in this graph, I show you the five particle number concentration. Again, across these different facility types. Now, if you look at this, if you are going to spend that $1 billion, where are, where, where, where are you going to spend the money? The street side, which again makes perfect sense because when you are walking on the street side, what is moving on the street? Cars, trucks, fresh, emit, freshly emitted, out of one smaller particles, right? That's why I think it's kind of in this system of thinking from different measures at different perspective, <laughs> very important. Here, that's why I was asked, are we doing the right thing? Here, look at, this is the US EPA air quality standard for PM, for particulate matter. And please look, this, what is this, what, what is this unit? Is this mass or number? Micrograms, micrograms. Our standard is based on mass. Of course, we should understand, right, you, you know, standard, you really need to be very cautious, and then you need to have enough scientific research to support. But at least, you can see that it shows something. And actually, in Europe, uh, the Euro 6 standard for new cars, they have already incorporated the number-based emission standard for new cars. Now, if you look at this, again, this is, again, this roadside. Merriment. This is where the road is, and this is in the daytime, this is the dominant wind direction, which means this is up, and this is down, and we measure the particles. Right? Remember why? I, what was my motivation to do this study? We want to study transport emission so that we can find out policies so that we can improve public health. Because so far, I think I did a pretty decent job, right? I study all those emissions, I take care of all those optimization and equity and non-linearity and the particles. And uh, how far am I 
from dealing with perfect class. If you look at this graph, the data because it is up or down. And in the evening time, this study was actually done because in uh, LA, in the evening time, the wind direction changed. And this become upper wind and this become downwind. And I know here we have a lot of CIFA students and after you graduate, you're going to find a job. And uh, do you think you're going to find a job here in Ithaca? From that, you're promised you're going to find a job from a bigger city like LA or New York. And you get a job and you're actually, you get a job in a big city and from here in LA. And your boss pays you decently such that right, you can buy a house. So basically, right, you work very hard uh, in the office and you buy a very nice house and, uh, here. And uh, after your boss, and she's very nice to you, and she, told, she tells you everything about how you can live well in LA. Right? And uh, your company actually have different sites. And after your boss, you know, after she knows she works in another office. Uh, she works in this office. And she, she's been there for 20 years, and you are here just for the first one, two years. And she, and she got a house here. So here, let me ask you. If you just look at this graph, do you want, assuming me, I was that student, do you want to be me this newly, get newly employed, or do you want to be my boss? Here, just look at this graph. Pardon me? You want to be the boss, right? That's very smart. And you want to be the boss not just because the boss is paid better. And if you look at this one here, between me and my boss, the daily exposure of atom particles is three really different. I'm using this graph to show actually, in my app, I know all about those kind of air pollution. And to go from air pollution to public health, actually there is still a very big gap, which is actually human activities. Human activities, activity patterns. Right? Which I believe social scientists play a very significant role in better understanding human activities. And also here, just very quickly, I show the same group here, this was the same day, the same group of my research. This is what we measured in Ithaca. We we'll go to New York City. This is what we measured. I already do show this slide to people in New York City. And I show this to people in Ithaca. Right. So anyway, and this is, I mean, this is supposed to be a, a animation, but you can see this actually we developed software to model, to make, to model the emissions of transportation in New York City with different scales. And also, we can even model this at a street level with this. So, in the end, to summarize, you can see it's very interesting. We human beings, as I told earlier, we act a lot of time, we act like two year old. We have these human needs we want to travel. And we have these human needs of goods, which is free transportation. At the bottom, because all these things are free transportation and also like passenger travel. Right? This all started from us. We have this need. But in the meantime, when we're driving, we're enjoying the food, transporting from other places, there are these emissions coming to the air. And uh, where do this kind of pollution go? In the end, in the end, it comes back to us. So this very nice, unfortunately, system, right, comes back to us. So that's why, you know, I'm saying, you know, we, if we want to deal with our life, we, if we deal with our transportation system, we need to definitely take this model disciplinary systems approach and to consider not only cost but also efficiency, equity, energy, and environment, and also reliability. So, I guess this is my last slide here. Thank you. <laughs>